Noam Chomsky and Edward S. Herman, S. Manufacturing Consent, The Political Economy of the Mass Media, 1988, is a seminal work that explores the ways in which mass media serves the interests of elite power structures rather than acting as a democratic force in society. The book presents the propaganda model, a framework that explains how the media functions to manufacture consent for the policies and interests of the ruling elite. Through the systematic filtering of news and information, manufacturing consent argues that in democratic societies, where outright coercion is less feasible than in authoritarian regimes, the mass media plays a crucial role in shaping public opinion to align with the interests of those in power. Chomsky and Herman assert that the media does not function independently or objectively, but rather as an instrument of propaganda that serves the interests of corporations government institutions, and other powerful entities. The propaganda model is central to this thesis, identifying five filters that determine what news is produced and how it is presented to the public. These filters are one, the size, ownership, and profit orientation of the mass media, two, advertising as the primary source of income for the media, 3. The reliance on official sources and experts. 4. Flack as a means of disciplining the media. And 5. Anti-communism. Later expanded to include other ideological enemies as a national religion and control mechanism. These filters ensure that the news that reaches the public is skewed in favor of the interests of the elite. While dissenting voices are marginalized or ignored. Chomsky presents five filters of the propaganda model. 1. Ownership and profit orientation. The first filter in the propaganda model is the concentration of media ownership in the hands of a few large corporations. Chomsky and Herman argue that as media outlets have become increasingly concentrated and corporatized, their primary goal has shifted from informing the public to generating profit. This shift influences the type of content that is produced as news that could threaten the interests of media owners or their corporate affiliates is less likely to be covered. Instead, media organizations tend to focus on stories that are sensational, trivial, or aligned with the interests of the ruling elite. The book details how media ownership is concentrated among a few conglomerates, which are themselves part of the broader corporate structure that includes interests in other industries. This interconnectedness creates a situation where media organizations have a vested interest in protecting the status quo and avoiding content that could undermine the economic or political interests of their owners. 2. Advertising as the primary income source. The second filter is the role of advertising as the main source of revenue for most media outlets. Chomsky and Herman argue that because media organizations rely heavily on advertising dollars, they are incentivized to produce content that appeals to advertisers rather than to the public interest. Advertisers prefer content that attracts large audiences, avoids controversy, and aligns with their own business interests. As a result, the media tends to shy away from stories that could alienate advertisers or challenge the consumerist culture that underpins their business model. The book provides examples of how media content is shaped by the need to attract advertising revenue 
leading to the exclusion of topics that might be critical of corporate practices or government policies. This filter ensures that the media reinforces the existing power structures rather than challenging them. 3. Sourcing mass media news. The third filter is the reliance on official sources and experts for news content. Chomsky and Herman argue that media organizations are dependent on government agencies, corporations, and other institutional sources for the bulk of their news. These sources are often seen as credible and authoritative, and they provide a steady stream of information that is easy for journalists to access and report on. However, this reliance on official sources means that the media often uncritically reproduces the viewpoints of those in power, while alternative perspectives are marginalized. Chomsky and Herman describe how this filter operates by limiting the range of debate and ensuring that the news reflects the interests of the elite. They also discuss the role of think tanks and other institutions that provide experts who reinforce the dominant narrative, further narrowing the scope of discussion. 4. Flack and the Enforce. The fourth filter is flack, a term Chomsky and Herman used to describe the negative responses that media outlets receive when they produce content that is critical of powerful interests. Flack can take the form of letters, lawsuits, petitions, and other forms of pressure that are aimed at disciplining the media and discouraging dissent. The book explains how flack is often orchestrated by powerful groups, such as corporations, government agencies, and lobbyists, who seek to protect their interests by discrediting or intimidating journalists and media organizations. This filter acts as a form of self-censorship, as media outlets become wary of producing content that could provoke a backlash from influential actors. 5. Anti-communism as a control mechanism. The final filter is the ideological control mechanism, which in the context of the Cold War, Chomsky and Herman identified as anti-communism. They argue that anti-communism was used as a national religion to justify repression, marginalize dissent, and frame conflicts in terms that supported U.S. foreign policy. The media played a crucial role in propagating this ideology by framing news stories in a way that demonized communism and portrayed U.S. actions as necessary to defend freedom and democracy. In later editions, this filter has been expanded to include other ideological enemies, such as terrorism or rogue states, which serve a similar function in justifying military interventions and suppressing alternative viewpoints. The authors argue that this filter ensures that the media remains aligned with the interests of the state and its allies while critical perspectives are marginalized or demonized. Manufacturing consent includes detailed case studies that illustrate how the propaganda model operates in practice. One of the most well-known case studies is the comparison of media coverage of the Indonesian invasion of East Timor and the Cambodian genocide under the Khmer Rouge. Chomsky and Herman show that the American media gave extensive coverage to the atrocities committed by the Khmer Rouge, which were perpetrated by an enemy of America, while largely ignoring the atrocities committed by the Indonesian government, an American ally. In East Timor, the disparity in coverage is used to demonstrate how the media selectively reports on human rights abuses.
based on the geopolitical interests of the American government. The authors argue that this selective coverage is not accidental, but rather a product of the filters outlined in the propaganda model. Another case study examines the media's treatment of the Vietnam War, particularly how the anti-war movement was portrayed and how the American government's narrative was disseminated and reinforced by the media. Chomsky and Herman analyze how dissenting voices were marginalized and how the media framed the war in terms that supported the American government's objectives. These case studies provide empirical evidence for the propaganda model, showing how media content is shaped by the filters of ownership, advertising, sourcing, flack, and ideology. The authors argue that these filters result in a systematic bias in media coverage that serves the interests of the elite, while marginalizing alternative perspectives. Chomsky and Herman also discuss the role of intellectuals and media critics in challenging the dominant media narratives. They argue that intellectuals have a responsibility to expose the biases and distortions in the media and to provide alternative sources of information that can help the public make informed decisions. However, they also acknowledge the challenges faced by dissident intellectuals who often lack access to mainstream platforms and face significant barriers to reaching a wide audience. The book emphasizes the importance of media literacy and critical thinking, encouraging readers to question the information they receive from mainstream sources and to seek out alternative perspectives. Chomsky and Herman advocate for the development of independent media outlets that are not beholden to corporate interests and can provide a more diverse range of viewpoints. Manufacturing consent has had a profound impact on the field of media studies and has been widely cited by scholars, activists, and journalists. The propaganda model has been applied to various contexts beyond the original scope of the book, including analyses of media coverage of the Gulf War, the War on Terror, and more recent conflicts. The book has also inspired a generation of media critics and activists who seek to challenge the power of corporate media and promote more democratic forms of communication. Chomsky and Herman S. work has contributed to a broader understanding of how media functions in capitalist societies and has highlighted the need for alternative media structures that can serve the public interest rather than corporate and state power. Despite its influence, manufacturing consent has also faced criticism, particularly from those who argue that the propaganda model is too deterministic and does not account for the complexities of media production. Critics have also pointed out that the media landscape has changed significantly since the book was first published, with the rise of digital media and social networks creating new dynamics in the dissemination of information. Manufacturing consent remains a foundational text in the study of media and propaganda. Chomsky and Herman's propaganda model offers a powerful framework for understanding how media serves the interests of the elite and how public opinion is shaped to align with the goals of those in power. The book challenges the notion of a free and independent press, revealing the ways in which media is influenced by corporate ownership, advertising, sourcing, flack, and ideology. While the media landscape has evolved since the book's publication, 
the insights provided by Chomsky and Herman continue to be relevant in understanding the dynamics of media power and the challenges of maintaining a truly democratic society. The book encourages readers to critically engage with the media, question dominant narratives, and seek out alternative sources of information to form a more complete and accurate understanding of the world. Top of form, bottom of form.